Our next speaker is a dear friend of mine, uh, Jean Baptiste, uh, who will talk to us about David, an AD, AD1 decoder. Hello. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I wonder why half of the room is here because you know probably better than David about than me. But let's try anyway. Uh, so um, yeah. Oops. Okay. So yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, I'm using KDE with Wayland and sometimes Crashy with LibreOffice. Um, yes. No, that doesn't. Uh, why does the clicker not work? Yeah, it works. Okay, so I'm the president of VideoLine. I work on various open source projects, including VLC, S264, David, FMPEG, and others, where I maintain some uh, DVD stack and a bit of Blu-ray stacks. Um, I'm annoying uh, to many of those uh, projects when they screw up. Um, so I'm not probably the biggest uh, developer there, but I'm doing everything else. No? Yes? So, AV1. Um, so VP9, is AV1 just VP9++? AV, VP9 is a semi-failure. Uh, it's a good codec, but no one uses it. Um, when you ask uh, YouTube, uh, they don't even have many people actually submitting video in VP9. And there are many reasons for that. Um, the reason is mostly because like, there was no spec for a long time. There was a codec, but no specs. Um, there was absolutely no ecosystem except a few open source tools. Um, like, have you ever watched an anime in VP9? Maybe, right? One? Okay, amazing. <laughs> You're the only one, right? Um, <laughs> but like, 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 like you've never been on, on, on the Pirate Bay, right? And, and so a VP9 encoding anime, right? So like the format is a failure. Um, one of the reasons also is that H.264 was so good and so well integrated that it worked. So they decided, um, so except YouTube and Netflix, no one actually used VP9 largely. Um, so for AV1, they decided to not just do VP10, but to do something that it was actually open with an actual ecosystem. And I think that's more or less um, they managed to do it. Um, it's interesting that basically there is like three companies that actually f worked on uh, AV1, um, Mozilla and Cisco plus Google. And there is an actual uh, alliance for open media, which is open and where people actually contribute. Well, we cannot do say that about VP9. So AV1 has a lot of amazing results. Uh, we are talking of 20 to 25% better than VP9 and around the same around HEVC and you can discuss about so many cases but like that's the rough numbers that you should remember 20% better than HEVC is a good number 25 uh, and there is a lot of things happening on the ecosystem there is at least three open source encoders um, one is going to be presented just after my talk uh, there is a LibEOM encoder which is like the reference one which is uh, extremely, extremely, extremely slow um, and a difficult code base. There is a new one that is uh, happening that called SVT AV1, which is basically um, done by Intel. Um, it's difficult to talk about that because like six months ago, it was nowhere. They were announced it at IBC six months ago and they're advancing fast. Um, it's actually usable uh, to produce some videos. Uh, but a lot of like non-open source people are working on AV1. There is Eve, that is a very good encoder about AV1, extremely slow also. Atem, Harmonic, Bitmovin also are doing a lot of things around AV1. And there are actual hardware encoders like um, NG Codec is working on and some other mostly Chinese companies working on FPGAs or ASICs uh, for AV1. There are actual deployments of AV1. Like, almost since day one, um, YouTube, Netflix, Facebook, but quite a few uh, cloud vendors who are selling a lot of things about encoding video have an option to encode to AV1. So people care, and you know what? There are specs, and there are even specs to put that inside, MP4, MKV, TS, and other stuff like that. Amazing, right? Um, and this year is a year of AV1 because hardware is coming. Um, Intel has more or less announced that they were doing it uh, this year uh, with their Gen 10 chips. Um, NVIDIA is also more or less said that they were for the next chip, so probably around uh, when, when they announced product, which is GDC usually. AMD also, but like the Samsung TV at CES had AV1 decoding, uh, AIM Logic, Broadcom, and a few others I forgot show chips that were actually usable, produced that can decode AV1. And all of those can decode both 8-bit and 10-bit, which is quite important because like you remember for H.264, a lot of people just had 8-bit decoders and not 10-bit. And 2020 is also 
the year of the competition. Like you probably heard about VVC, which is coming in July, uh, EVC, which is coming between April and July, um, which is basically a, a, a version of a VVC with less patents. Uh, <laughs> there is something called MPEG-5 LC EVC, ECV, something like that, which is actually not a codec, but just like post and pre uh, filters. Um, and uh, the AOM community is already talking about research on AV2. So things are going fast. So is that an actual competition? I don't think so. Um, most, in, like, VVC is amazing in terms of technical quality. Most of the improvements are based on HVC, and HVC has three or four patent pools, so like you can expect that since H264 had two, HVC, VVC is going to have five or six or seven. Um, means like no one can actually deploy that because it's insane, so many patent pools. And there is so many people um, who are now big companies who are just turned into patent holes like Nokia, who are outside of patent tool, um, pools anyway. Um, and so the question is, are improvements good enough uh, to justify the cost? Well, like HVC is not deployed anywhere than broadcast, uh, so everything that is online is basically skipped that. So I guess it's going to be the same for VVC. EVC, which is like, oh, we're, we're not really so much patented, but then you remove some of the gain. So like, if you remove so many of the gains, you're going to be at the level of AV1, then why not choose AV1, right? Um, and then like, other stuff are actually not codecs and could be applied to open source codecs. So I think that um, even if competition is coming, they're going to have, that's their last big shot, and they might have like, difficulties. So, David. Um, David um, is an AV1 decoder, as the name says. Um, the, the, the idea was that we actually need to have a good and fast uh, software decoder, because like a lot of people are not going to have hardware decoders, and until people can decode, then you're screwed because your, pro, your, your codec is not being to played anywhere. And, and the problem is that everything you're going to see, it's true for AV1, for VVC, and all the new codecs, they are very complex. Like, a lot of code is required to write an AV1 decoder. Uh, because like, we, tried, like, we tried to take any small gains. So, so there is lots of tools and you take 1% here, 1% here, 1% here, but that's a huge code base compared to H264 or VP8 or VP9. Um, so the idea was like, we need to have a very good software implementation that is extremely fast and like every cycle counts because if we are going to deploy that, it's going to be billions of people who will still have their correct and um, actual machine that they have today and not their new machines. Um, and if we don't have that, then everyone will fail. Uh, the idea was to use basically the people from uh, VLC, FFmpeg, and x 64 who actually know how to write C and how, know how to correctly um, write portable and cross-platform tools um, and don't use um, CMake or um, some weird configure stuff like libvpx and libaom that basically is impossible to port to so many platforms. Uh, and one of the goals was to have a small binary size because for um, YouTube or Facebook, when they ship the decoder in their uh, Android apps, they actually care about the binary size. And that was, for example, the mistake um, that was done in FFVP9, which was a FMPEG, uh, FVP9 decoder that was done before by basically the team that basically did David. And they didn't care that much about the um, uh, binary size, and that um, was an issue. So we launched it well, last year, now almost one year and a half ago in October 2018, uh, and we had like a release quite um, soon after, and it's been improving quite a bit. Um, just a bit of history, like, announced was in October, like, like already like three months after we had like the first release, which was already four times faster than the reference and the only uh, decoder at that time, um, and I was of course focused on x86, 64-bits, um, and then, like, um, after three months, we did uh, another release, which was focused on ARM. Um, like, we are already twice as fast as LibOM on ARM64. And the same, uh, we went every release, we focused on, like, less important platforms, like ARM32, and then SSC3, and then even FFC2, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so we have, like, one release every two or three months, which is quite nice. Performance is amazing, right? Like, we're talking about three to five times faster than the reference decoder. The reference decoder has assembly in it, right? Like, it's not like we're comparing C to, to non-C versions, right? It's assembly against assembly. Um, when we started, um, Ronald, who wrote a lot of the code of David, said, yeah, we might be two, or two, two and a half times faster. No, we are 
a lot faster. And we're even faster on SSC2, where we did not write as much assembly as we did for the other platforms. Then ARM. Um, so ARM, um, you can see that I'm comparing to the new, oh yeah, wow, well, I got to let, uh, the new one, which is LibGAV1, which is a, another decoder wrote by Chrome, um, and totally not in a non-invented ear syndrome fashion. Uh, because I really wanted to have one that will be faster than David on ARM. Um, so that's the blue one. And as you can see, well, David is quite a bit faster already. Um, and they're improving, but they're not getting close to us. Um, so we're talking two, two and a half to four times faster than uh, the other decoders. Um, that's a question that was like, um, asked quite a bit in the past, which was, um, what is the complexity of doing AV1 decoding? So here you can see in yellow, which is the FF H264 decoder, so the decoder of um, H264 inside FFmpeg. Then you have in red the VP91, and then in, in green you got HEVC and David. Um, what you can see more or less is that, of course, VP9 and H264 are way easier to decode, but that when you spend enough time on David, on AV1, you can do decoders that are around the same complexity than FFHEVC. Um, then you're going to say, yeah, but you didn't spend enough time in HEVC. Sure, we could maybe make the HEVC decoder a bit faster, but not so much faster. So AV1 is not that complex to decode in terms of CPU, but as there are many tools, it's long to code. Okay, um, are there some weird stuff in, on the David? Yes, there are two, oops, uh, there are two things that are weird for a decoder. The first one is that it's a dual pass decoder, not encoder, you see I just made the mistake. Uh, it's quite rare to have that. The first pass is basically to analyze a few things to be able to, um, to, to schedule after, um, and also to, to do a lot of parsing because there is a lot of things to pass uh, at the entry point of an AV1 stream. Um, OBU and other stuff that were probably not the best uh, designed ever, uh, but they were in a rush. And the second one decodes. Uh, and, and we have a, what is more um, important for most of the people is that we have a dual threading model. So we have a frame threading model, so you start decoding one frame before the next one. But at the same time, so we have a slice or tile threading models where you can basically, because most of the video you're going to see in AV1 are encoding slice or tiles. Um, so you can start decoding like the first row, the second row, the third row, and so on. So when you, when you uh, try to get the best performance out of, of David, you need to basically set both the, how many uh, tiling thread and how many framing threads you're going to have. And the thing is, we might add more threads uh, for the filters. Um, so um, we need to do something about that to have everything automatic and works at the best. Um, and we would like not to use machine learning to decide that, even though it's completely in fashion to do that. Um, the rest like, looks like a normal uh, decoder like you have in LibEV codec, except a bit bigger. So the question is, why? Um, why is David faster than the competition? Um, and there are like three main reasons. The first one is like, here we're seeing the single thread C version. And you see that the C is quite well optimized uh, and well written because already the C version in single thread is fast. And more is coming because there is one big part of uh, David that, was, that is not optimized in the C version that is coming soon, in two weeks. Yeah, sure, uh, in two weeks. <laughs> Um, the threading is quite amazing. Like, um, so is this is the number of threads. Yes, this is 2,000 threads. That is a graph that was done by some of the Mozilla teams. Um, and, and you see that basically like David actually like scale with threading quite a bit. And, and if you see uh, LibOM or EJV1, they just like cap around four or eight threads and then they, they don't improve while David can still improve, which means that like it's actually good. Um, Oops, of course, all the other way. Um, and we write actually low uh, level code. Um, that means C. Um, so libjv1 is in C++, so there is no C++ overhead. We write handwritten assembly, not intrinsics. Yeah, but intrinsics are easier. Yes, they are easier. But you lose between 10 to 15%. That's what we've seen lately on the various threads on the FFmpeg mailing list. Intrinsics are slower, almost always. 
Um, so no interesting handwritten assembly. So basically, David is like, the C version is faster in single thread. We can scale better with threads, and we write lower level code, which means that, of course, no one is going to be David ever. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, in an AV1, in David, there is like eight stages that are basically, um, um, that we managed to ISM correctly. The first one is the MSAC, which is basically uh, an entropy decoder. There is inverse transform, the motion compensation, the intra prediction, and then the full after is our loop fil our filters. Loop filter, loop restoration, the famous CDEF, and the film grain. Um, film grain is quite um, debatable because a lot of people don't like that. But so when you now start and run uh, David and you perf it, you realize that the, 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 the parts that are basically non ISM are around 25% of the runtime. Um, and that's mostly on the, what we call the FMV and the decode uh, coefficients. Um, so that's for AVX2, FSC3, I'm 34, and I'm, uh, I'm 64, I'm 32. Uh, you can see that basically the optimization done for AVX2 are full and we, there is not much to gain on writing better optimizations. Um, there is just like a few tools like in 444 or some interpretations that are not done. For SSC3, SSC3 is probably one of the most difficult assembly to write because we need to support both 32 bits, which has absolutely no registers, and 64 bits. And you need to care about the Windows calling convention and the Linux convention, and of course Mac, which is another mess. So that's quite a bit um, difficult, but that was mostly done. There is some field grain that is done, but it's not merged yet. So next release, it's merged. And as you can see, we did some parts in SSC2 because that was easier. Mostly it's an entropy decoder, which there is no in AVX2. Um, some of the motion compensation, one of the loop restoration, and the CDEF. ARM64, you can see that most every, mostly everything is done except uh, the film grain. Um, and ARM32 has still quite a bit of work to be done. The entropy coding, the inverse transform, which is large to write in um, uh, for everyone because it's quite large. And the intra predictions, like there is uh, DC, H, and V that are done, but the rest are not. Which brings me to that. Um, here you can see basically the, oops, you can see the, so X264 is an encoder, it's extremely fast, it's blah, 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 we wrote a lot of assembly. And when you look at the graph of uh, X264, you see that around 25% of the code base is assembly and um, the rest is C. Um, and of course, like, if you look, uh, X264 is 68,000 lines of code and around, you see, 37 lines of code of assembly. And when you take the whole LibEV codec, which is half a million lines of code in C, you see that it's 80,000 lines of code of assembly. But David is weird. It's only 25,000 lines of C, but it's already 64 kilo lines of code of assembly. That's like al that's more than, a lot more than X264, and almost as much as what you have in LibEV codec, because there is the 10 bits ARM assembly and X86 assembly that is coming soon, and it's going to make that just for one decoder to be right more assembly than the whole LibEV codec. We worked on something weird um, last uh, summer. Um, so if you listen to me like one year ago, uh, I would say like, yeah, everything related to GP, GPU is idiotic. It's too slow. There is too much latency. Um, I, I've said that quite a, bit, <laughs> quite a few times. Um, and other people of the community said that too, right? It's very difficult because then you have like the latency to upload the textures and get it back. And like, it's quite difficult. A lot of tools are CUDA based and which is like not open source at all uh, because like NVIDIA doesn't like open source. Um, but we said like, what about we try anyway? Um, in David, the film grain is already a GLSL shader, right? You have a C version that is optimized, but what we advise people is to actually do that in the player because the film grain is really at, at after the, your decoding is done. Uh, but the question was, can we do more? Can we do CDEF, loop restoration, and loop, other loop filters? And it's very difficult because you cannot really know if it's going to be faster, but do you actually care about being faster or do you not? Um, what you mostly care about is the consumption, right? How, how much battery drain is it going to be on your phone, on your Android phone? 
Um, and because as soon as you got 60 FPS, you don't care of doing 70 FPS. It's only for gamers who care about 140 Hz. But for video, you don't care about that. What you care is to not drain your battery when you're watching your video on Instagram or in Snapchat or whatever you're watching. Um, so we had a GSOC um, who did that uh, during the summer. The guy had no idea about mostly everyone. Um, and so he did basically the CDEF and the loop restoration, so both SDR and Vinner, uh, in uh, Vulcan shaders, tested on an Android Huawei phone, um, I think. Uh, yeah, Huawei P20. And what you see is that, what we saw is that, like, we didn't get any speed increase. However, for, for like, basically the same... Um, the same decoding time, so we put basically a VLC running and play, be, playing the file on loop, you see that basically we get 20% less battery drain on that, um, just by using GPU um, compute shaders, um, which was not expected. Um, so what is the future? The next work on, on, on David is going to be, of course, 10 bits, um, and uh, then uh, decide what we can do about uh, GP, GPU, and um, how can we move that to the next level? Thank you, and I'm taking questions. Am I allowed? Yeah, yeah sure. How much uh, time do we have? We have a lot of questions. <laughs> we have a lot of questions. I'm not sure we'll be able to answer all of them, but let's start how the dual path requirements fits with the current low latency trend in the streaming world. Um, I don't think it matters most, much on the way it's done. Um, it could be problematic um, in some cases, but I don't think it matters the way it's implemented. Maybe you should thread that also, but that should be okay. Are the CISVEL patent pool for everyone valid? I would say no. Um, they, they are surely uh, IV1 patent pool, uh, pool patents that exist because like, there is a patent on absolutely everything. I think it's like very, very, very small things, so they don't matter at all. And I think it's just the usual FUD bullshit that they're doing. All of this is for 8 bits, which is nice and fast. What about 10 bits and HDR? Yeah, it's coming. Uh, probably first will be ARM64 and then x86. Is it possible to use AV1 as an interact or that? Yes. Is it a good idea? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? You, um, I think uh, stuff like FF, uh, FFV1 are easier to, to do that. I mean, like. I don't think uh, AV1 was done for that, but like there are people around there that might know better. AVIF. Yeah, AVIF for images, but. What are the major companies missing from AOM and to push uh, BBC? Uh, I would say that some of the people who are in AOM, like Samsung and Apple, are important, and we don't know exactly what they're doing uh, because those are big companies. Who is currently using David? Oh, oh, that's a good question. So every version of Chrome, every version of Firefox that is shipped, every version of VLC, FMPEG, and most uh, players based on FMPEG use David. So that's around everyone that is shipping everyone except Android. What kind of operations do you use from SSC 3.3 that are not in SSC 2? Just uh, ask that guy. But if you want more details, ask him. <laughs> can, can David use GPU acceleration? I think you answered that. Yeah, no, that's not OpenCL, not CUDA. This is compute shaders. We're using uh, Vulkan compute shaders and, and not. When do you think we can expect wide AV1 support in cheap, low-end devices? End of the year. <laughs> September, you will have cheap or cheapest Android, like 200 to $300 devices that can decode AV1. 8-bit, 10-bit, 1080p. Real time. Thank you, David. Thanks.